Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Supermoon Skywatch tonight. Uh, my name is Carissa Cedor, and I am an educator in the Buell Planetarium, and I am joined by oh, the whole team almost tonight. Uh, we're here with uh, Mike, Julie, and Kayla. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello there. And we're really excited to bring you lots of cool uh, information tonight about our moon. So, can everyone see our moon right now on the screen? Hopefully you can see it. So, as we are looking at our moon right now, you may have seen the moon last night. It's a little cloudy today, uh, but you may have noticed the moon nice and bright in the sky last night. Uh, it is a full moon today, which means the full disk of the moon from our perspective here on Earth is illuminated. So the moon is always there, it's always technically full, but we can't always see the full illumination. Now it's also a super moon, what's called a super moon. Uh, and what that means is that the moon is actually at its closest point to the earth right now in its orbit. It's perigee uh, is what it's called. So when that happens, the moon appears slightly larger in our sky. Uh, now, how much larger does it appear? turns out not too incredibly much larger. Just, a, just about 14% larger on average. We can see the normal moon and the super moon. Not too much of a difference there. But you might notice a little bit to your eye that the moon looks just a bit bigger when it is a super moon. And it's certainly on nights like last night where it was clear here in Pittsburgh, uh, shining brightly in our sky is certainly a spectacle. So taking a look at our moon in our sky, unfortunately it is cloudy today, but we can actually take you to the moon today. So I'm gonna turn it over to my teammates and we're going to visit some of our favorite places on the moon and take a look at different ways that humans have explored the moon. So not just visiting in person, but also sending lots of cool robots there as well. So take it away, guys. I think um, we can head towards, um, we're gonna be probably focusing a lot on the Southern part of the moon because some cool things are gonna be going on there, but there's a crater that's very, very easy to see called Tycho Crater. It's located in the Southern Lunar Highlands and it's named for Tycho Brahe. He was the last of the naked eye astronomers. Uh, those are the people who observed without a telescope. And when you think about it, Tycho Brahe died in 1601 and Galileo first light on his telescope was 1609. So, oh, how very close. Uh, but it's a really popular target for amateur astronomers often because they wanna look at this. This is the peak in the center of this crater. Um, the summit of this central peak, it's about 1.2 miles high. It stretches, oh, about 9.3 miles, the whole chain of these peaks in the center. Um, the mountains formed in a matter of minutes after this impact. And the area that's flat around that, that was cooling lava. It was so hot that that area of lava cooled and has sort of a flat area. Carissa, did you wanna talk a little bit more about that? The center? Sure, yeah. Tycho is a really interesting crater. And one of the reasons why it's so prominent is because it's thought to be one of the younger craters on the moon. So looking at Tycho Crater, we can see things like uh, there aren't many craters inside of Tycho Crater. Uh, so not many impacts have happened after that impact. Uh, we can also see what I think Julie is about to talk about uh, is it's its array of uh, ejecta, the matter that kind of spewed out and away from that collision. And the fact that we can see that shows us that this is still a pretty young uh, crater. Yeah, it would have gradually faded over time. So seeing this, they look for the central peak, look for this gorgeous ejecta, these bright, brilliant rays that stretch out so far. So what sets this apart is its apparent youth. And what's interesting, is this material scattered so far that they think some of this might have, uh, some of the samples might have been taken from the Apollo 17 site. So they studied those samples, which were about 108 million years old. And they think if it did come from Tycho Crater, 
that this crater would then be 108 million years old, which seems old, right, to us. But when you consider all these neighboring craters that are about 3.9 million years old, this is the new kid on the block. Um, and there's a lot of interest in this because the crater was preserved. So if we can gather samples and help us date this crater, we can then learn about dating other craters, not only on the lunar surface, but out um, in other parts of our solar system. But one of the cool things also is who it's named for. Tycho Brahe was a nobleman in Denmark, uh, but a lot of people know about him because he lost his nose in a duel with a third cousin. Um, and he had sort of a suspicious death. It turned out he was not poisoned. He probably had a, uh, it was a bladder issue, but um, there's lots of legends about his life. And sometimes that gets in the way of what an extraordinary astronomer he was and that his work and the instruments he developed helped further astronomers down the road. Um, he measured positions of stars. His observations were so accurate, considering it was before the telescope. He cataloged over a thousand stars. He showed irregularities in the moon's orbit for the first time. He made observations that were consistent in supporting Copernicus's theories, but he felt um, that even though it's a heliocentric theory that still the sun went around the earth, but all the other planets went around the sun. So he was close. Um, helping him prove this was the supernova in, in, in um, 1572. And he noticed what they called a new star. And everybody got upset. They said, but it's a perfect heavens. There's no new things. There's no anything changes. And he was the one who said, yes, it's something new and it's out beyond the moon. And the same with the great comet in uh, 1577, that that was orbiting out beyond the moon and it shifted the perceptions. Kepler was his assistant in his last year of his life and Kepler used a lot of this information that he learned from Rahe and that helped him with his um, laws of planetary motion and that helped later on Sir Isaac Newton. So I think Newton is famous for say, saying that he stands on the shoulders of giants and you can actually see this lineage of giants in um, an astronomical history. One of the cool things you may not know is he was an artist, he was a craftsman. Everything he did, he wanted to have beautiful, he wanted to surround himself with beauty. And what he accomplished using just, just his instruments and his practical knowledge was, was one of the most astounding accomplishments of not just his time, but all time. considering he had no telescopes. <laughs> awesome, so where do we want to head next? Well, I think now that we've learned about some place that we can see with the naked eye and some of these early observations um, from Earth, um, maybe a great place to head now would be uh, to some of the first uh, times that people have set foot on the moon. Sure, Mike, do you want to take us there? Uh, sure. Yeah, we will head. Um, you can see on the screen right now that the moon looks a little bit darker than where we were earlier with Tycho Crater. Uh, we are looking at a great representation of the Maria. Uh, that's a Latin word for seas. Uh, ancient people looked up and uh, thought these were, were basins of water on the moon. Uh, they are actually flat, uh, nearly smooth volcanic plains from ancient lava eruptions. It's hard to think of the moon as once being volcanic active, but it was. Uh, we are going to head in now to probably the most famous of those Maria or seas. That's the Sea of Tranquility. We're going to zoom in on that uh, just to give you a, a quick look at where uh, the Apollo 11 mission landed. Now, one of my favorite backstories with Apollo 11 uh, is uh, Commander Michael Collins, uh, who just passed recently, uh, but who part of his training was to go to a planetarium, uh, Moorhead Planetarium in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and he studied the summer stars, uh, memorized about 40 bright stars, and he had a telescope on board the ship, looked out the window, would need to pick a couple stars every time they were changing the ship's attitude uh, to make sure things were correct and, and relay that information back to Houston uh, to make sure they knew which way the ship was pointing. Uh, so he literally navigated the way to the moon by studying the stars, uh, and he studied those stars in a planetarium. So that's the Sea of uh, 
tranquility right there. Uh, the Sea of Serenity is above it. Uh, but we're actually going to head now toward the western edge of the moon's near side for the largest sea, the largest Maria of all. Uh, it's actually so big uh, that it qualifies as an ocean, if you will. Uh, it's the Ocean of Storms. Uh, and it's this huge, stretching 1,800 miles across the Ocean of Storms right there. It's the only one this big, uh, and that was a quagmire for lunar geologists for a long time. Uh, for a while, the prevailing thought was that there had been a huge impact, uh, an ancient impact that created this. Uh, but then came along the GRAIL mission, which orbited the moon in 2011 and 2012, uh, and it found evidence that beneath all of that dark um, basaltic rock from ancient lava, uh, that there's evidence of a rift valley. Uh, so on Earth, a rift valley is created by geologic activity, uh, often along tectonic plate boundaries in a place where there might be a crack in the land. Uh, and GRAIL mapped gravitational anomalies and unevenness on the moon. Uh, and it found these formations, square-shaped formations, resembling rift valleys uh, beneath the lava plains. Uh, and Carissa, I think we have a... Uh, a representational color image of uh, the grail data, right? We can pop up on the screen for you all to take a look at. So we're about to take a look at some data that came to us from the grail mission, um, mapped from orbit. And there's a false color there, uh, the different colors representing uh, the gravity gradient on the moon. Uh, and the way we see that translating is basically how the lunar magma plumbing system works. Uh, the conduits that fed the lava upward to the surface during the ancient volcanic eruptions, well, they would have fed that lava upward in an uneven way uh, if the gravity isn't distributed evenly all the way around the moon. So uh, we had this churning deep in the interior of the moon, um, and it basically led to a high concentration of lava in that, in that western edge on the moon's near side, which today we see as uh, the ocean of storms. Now that dark rock too, I said is basaltic. That's an igneous rock like we have on earth. And it comes from the rapid cooling of lava. Uh, it's rich in magnesium and iron. And that's what's responsible for that dark coloration you see on that side of the moon. Now, before we um, leave the ocean of storms, I wanted to give a shout out to Apollo 12. Uh, that's sort of the middle child of lunar exploration between the, the celebratory first mission, Apollo 11, and of course the heroism of Apollo 13. Uh, but the At Apollo 12 mission landed in the ocean of storms where we just were. Uh, the mission was in November of 1969, and there are a few things that make it interesting. Uh, for one, it was struck by lightning just a few seconds after liftoff, uh, and there was an intrepid flight controller named John Aaron. Uh, he scrambled. He knew just what switch the crew should flip, uh, an obscure switch, and, and uh, <laughs> signaled up to the crew, and they were able to get telemetry back on track. Uh, they had a few advantages over Apollo 11. They took hammocks with them this time to rest a little more comfortably <laughs> when they were on the moon. Uh, they deployed a lot of interesting science experiments while they were there to measure the moon's magnetic field, uh, to study the solar wind, the strength, the direction, uh, the composition. Uh, they set up seismometers to measure moon quakes and other movements in the crust. And Apollo 12 actually landed within walking distance of a robot that had been sent there just a couple years earlier, Surveyor 3, in 1967. Uh, so they were actually able to walk on over to Surveyor, and there we've got a great picture. Thanks, Carissa. They were able to bring a piece of uh, the robot lander back with them uh, from Apollo 12, as long uh, as well as some, some moon rocks. Also, the crew, I think, deserves a, a little shout out. Uh, it was an all Navy crew. Uh, the commander was Pete Conrad. He went on to command Skylab 2. Um, his first words on the moon were, whoopee! Man, that must have been a small story. Step, small one for Neil, but that was a long one for me. <laughs> and that, that that whole thing was basically a bet he had with a reporter. Uh, Neil Armstrong, of course, came up with his own famous lines in history. Uh, the reporter made a bet with with Conrad to see if he would use uh, his own words, and and he sure did. <laughs> so he had a lot of zest for life, and his first words were were whoopee when he landed on the moon. Um, rounding out the crew, uh, we had Alan Bean. He was the lunar module pilot, and he actually brought some of the moon dust back with him on his mission patches that he was permitted to keep and took granules of that moon dust and put it into his paintings. He became a painter later 
painted lunar landscapes uh, that have actual pieces of the moon inside them, uh, which is pretty awesome. And then uh, Richard Gordon uh, rounded out the crew. He stayed in orbit around the moon uh, as the command module pilot. Uh, also a very cool uh, cool guy. He was a chemist, uh, went on to work for the NFL, the March of Dimes, Boy Scouts, um, you know, sandwiching a landing in the moon in between all of that. Uh, so just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Apollo 12 and uh, the place in history that it earned. Uh, Apollo 11 uh, and Apollo 12 had a lot in common, both picking Maria uh, to land on. Um, they had a lot of the same geological interests too, in terms of their science. Uh, because Apollo 12 may have been the first moon landing if Apollo 11 uh, didn't work out. But uh, I think now that we've talked a little bit about our accomplishments in the 60s, I'm going to uh, turn things over to Kayla to tell us where we're headed next in the future of lunar exploration. Excellent. Well, let's head on over to Lacus Mortis, which roughly translates to Lake of Death which sounds very foreboding, but it is leading to an amazing future for, that does sound foreboding. <laughs> for everyone in space exploration. This is a large plain of basaltic lava flows that's stretching 90 miles in diameter, and it's located in the northeastern region of the moon. Now near the center of this region, we can spot a 25 mile wide complex crater named Berg. Now, what makes this crater so unique is its structure. And we kind of saw this with Tycho Crater as well. It's considered a complex crater too. Smaller craters tend to have, and we can see a couple examples here, very circular outlines. You can see almost a perfect circle impact. But Berg and Tycho Crater that we saw earlier, they actually have kind of a potato chip outline there. They're very wavy and rigid. Now, Berg also has a very unique feature. If you look very close on our screen here, you can see that center peak there. It's actually split into two. And Carissa just brought up some of the riles or giant cracks that we see in the surface. Those were created by lava tubes. Now this image that Carissa brought up is actually a very unique site. This is the future of space exploration. There is a company named Astrobotic that's located here in Pittsburgh that is actually landing on the moon very, very soon. They plan on launching later this year. Now, they've been developing space robotics and technology for quite some time, and they're very hopeful that they can make the moon and space accessible to everyone, not just scientists, but anyone who wants to have some space exploration. In 2014, they actually started in the Google Lunar X Prize. Now, unfortunately, they weren't able to make their original launch date. They had to push it back to this year, but they've still been doing some pretty awesome things. They are hopeful that this feature right here, this is why they picked Lacus Mortis as their landing site. This is called a skylight or a hole in the lunar surface where the ground has actually collapsed, exposing an extinct lava tube. Now, there are more than 300 of these features on the surface of the moon, but this one's very special. You can see at the bottom of this picture here, this wall has actually collapsed. Normally, these tubes are very straight down where you would have to repel or bungee down into them, which none of our rovers can currently do and currently no one on space is doing these things. Could you imagine an astronaut repelling into a hole? They don't know how deep it is, what's down there. So we wanna send a rover first. And this particular hole is perfect for that because the wall that has collapsed has created a perfect ramp down to the bottom of this tube. Now, the scientists at Astrobotics believe that there is a cave at the bottom of this, which could lean down into the lunar surface and caves are really special. Our ancestors lived in caves because they provide natural protection from the elements. And our first lunar colony could form inside of a cave. That's what they're hoping for anyway, that this would provide the most ideal environment, make it very easy on our astronauts to be able to build something there because they would already have a basic structure. Now, their little, lander that they have going is called Peregrine and it is they're calling it the bus 
because they are packing it full of all types of equipment. They're shuttling different Google Lunar X Prize rovers to the, to the moon's surface here. We can see that it looks like a giant brick here, essentially. We can see that it has some very sturdy legs. It'll hold all of that different equipment. It's also gonna hold some other pretty unique things as well. There is a Japanese drink company that makes a drink called Pakari Sweat. And they've created this very unique capsule that they're shipping off with this lander. This capsule, they had a bunch of Japanese students write their dreams of space exploration down. They put them in this capsule and they gave each student a very unique ring. This capsule can only be opened with that student's ring. So future astronauts may actually be able to open that capsule and it encourages them to start looking into space exploration, which is really impressive. Now, this lander itself has all types of equipment on it as well. It's got solar panels to recharge its own batteries. It's got all types of equipment for sensing around it, such as Doppler, it has sun sensors, it has star trackers, it has LIDAR, it has hazard detections, so it can detect if there's anything underneath it and recorrect its course. That way it has the best chance of landing on the moon's surface. Now there's also another very funny thing that is taking a trip there, not just science equipment, not just a really cool time capsule for later, but there is a hard drive that is going along for the ride. This hard drive was by Mr. Beast, a very popular YouTuber. He had a donation system brought out that if anyone donated $10, they could submit any image files that they wanted to be sent to the moon and he would send it along with this package, which is really amazing. Astrobotics is doing some pretty incredible things and really trying to make space accessible to everyone. I'm very excited to see what happens later this year. You know, Kayla, it's kind of exciting to me as a, a Pittsburgher to think, going back to Apollo 11 and, and the 1960s, that Pittsburgh played such a big role in powering those moon landings, just all the muscle that went into building the Saturn V, all the foundries and um, glass and steel and aluminum in this area, but also all of the, the know-how about mapping the surface of the moon. Um, that came from Carnegie Mellon University that was so critical. Um, but now here we are again in Pittsburgh um, is powering the, the return to the moon um, and Astrobotic is, is teeing up to send these, these rovers along, um, all of which will be leading to eventually uh, NASA's Artemis program, putting the first woman and the next man on the moon. Um, which I think will take us to our next location. Uh, we're gonna head to the moon's South Pole, which is very tantalizing. Uh, Apollo 11 and 12 we talked about earlier were in Lunar Maria, um, and they landed near the equator, but now we have our sights on the south pole of the moon, um, as opposed to landing Apollo 11 near the equator. Um, the trip that Kayla mentioned, um, and some future trips from Astrobotic um, of a robot known as the Griffin Lander, um, will be heading to the south pole of the moon and to Shackleton Crater. Now that's named, um, not coincidentally, for an Antarctic explorer and for uh, the Earth's South Pole, Ernest Shackleton. Um, but we're heading to the South Pole of the Moon because uh, we get these really interesting extremes. Uh, the peaks along the crater's rim are exposed to almost continual sunlight, but that interior of the crater is perpetually in shadow. Um, and it's thought those low temperatures in the interior function as kind of a cold trap. So uh, they could capture and freeze things that come from comets during impacts. Um, there have been measurements by a, the Lunar Prospector that showed lots of hydrogen, great evidence that there's water ice there. Um, so there's lots of things that are interesting for us. One is, of course, that possibility to have frozen water uh, for generating fuel for human consumption on the moon, um, but also the sunlight. Um, up on the peaks that you could have, um, you know, sunlight for converting into electricity with solar panels. Uh, and landing here might be better than being at the equator where the temperatures can get so extreme when the sun is, is directly overhead. Uh, so NASA, uh, in just a couple years, will be sending its Viper uh, 
robot, uh, a mobile explorer, uh, and uh, it will be going again, going back to you, Kayla, aboard Astrobotics homegrown Griffin Lander. Uh, and uh, when Viper gets there, its job will be as a mobile robot to get a close-up view of Shackleton Crater and look for the location and the concentration of water ice that could be there to be harvested to sustain human exploration. It'll be the first kind of surface level mobile robot uh, resource mapping mission that we have on another celestial body. Uh, and this all ties into NASA's plan for us to return to the moon through Project Artemis and eventually learn how we can map and find and sustain ourselves uh, one day on the planet Mars. Uh, so lots of exciting stuff, I think, uh, in store for us as we plan to head back to the moon for good. I think we all wanted to talk about Shackleton a little bit. We probably should have flipped a coin. So I'm going to throw it back out to the team if there's anything else I <laughs> anything else I missed. Because I think we all, when we were planning for this, I think we all picked Shackleton as our favorite target. <laughs> so... I just, I'm always fascinated that, of course, Shackleton would get a crater in the south because he explored the Antarctic and longed the Antarctic to such an extent, the southern part of Earth, that uh, when he finished his days and died there, he's buried there. It just was his happy place. Um, but I am also fascinated by exactly what Mike said, that this crater is the rim. These peaks are forever in sunlight. They are always illuminated. Um, and then completely in shadow at the bottom of the crater. So you have extremes in one same place, which in some ways people might say that of Antarctica on Earth, the extremes. Um, but in this particular extreme, we hope that humans can build a, a new base. Now, Mike, we did have a question come in from a viewer. Why aren't there any pictures of lunar landers on the moon taken by earthbound telescopes. I'll let you take that away. Oh, that's a great question. I'll, I'll throw it out to the team if anyone wants to jump in. Yeah, so a lot of the reason is uh, those objects are very small and the moon is pretty far away, right? On average, about 240,000 miles. Um, and the objects we send are only, you know, a couple feet wide, a couple feet across. Um, something really cool, though, is there have been images taken from off the moon. Um, other lunar missions like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is an unmanned spacecraft that lives in orbit around the moon, has actually been able to look down at the surface and take images. Uh, hopefully, I have one popping up here in a second. Uh, that <laughs> has taken images of the surface. We can actually see uh, tracks left over from uh, missions that had lunar rovers. Uh, lunar roving vehicles. So uh, we can actually see the tracks of where they drove those vehicles, which is really fun. Uh, we can see the descent stages left behind um, those, the bottom parts, right, of their spacecraft that helped them blast back off uh, to Earth. Uh, and even footpaths, right, we can actually see where the astronauts walked on the moon. Um, and we can see these things because the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, LRO, is a lot closer, right? It's in orbit around the moon. So it's still pretty far away, but it has a better view uh, and its eyes, its telescopes can actually resolve those tiny, tiny objects and see them on the lunar surface. That is pretty awesome. <laughs> That shot of of the the Challenger and the and the tracks, just that we can have something in orbit and be able to get get photos from orbit uh, as as proof that humans have have been to the moon and um, that we'll be going back again soon. So we visited a lot of great places uh, in the moon. Maybe I'll just throw it out to the team one last time. Any other parting thoughts? If not, well, we will. Thing, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Talk about viewing. I'm sorry, Mike. I just go ahead. Back to viewing the moon and how much people like to view the moon. And when you actually get a chance to look at it, we're celebrating this super moon right now and how full and how bright it is that it's actually brighter than you'd expect. But when you're looking through a telescope or binoculars, sometimes the best time to look at the moon is actually when it's in a partial phase. 
um, because then you can really see the definition of the craters of the ejecta lines of the seas and it's in much greater definition what we call the terminator line uh, not named for any movies but um, that terminates light and dark so when you actually get a chance to view for yourself that's a really good time to get out yeah so that's a great point um, we also would love to invite uh, everyone to join us this summer uh, on site at Buell Planetarium at Carnegie Science Center. Um, we've been streaming uh, ENS Digistar 7. We were recently renovated um, and we have a beautiful view of the moon, uh, which we loved sharing with you tonight, but we'd love to share it with you uh, under our, our 50 foot dome in the Buell Planetarium. So so do come on down to Carnegie Science Center and, and uh, check it out. Um, we'll also be back uh, once a week. Uh, every Thursday morning, we do a bite-sized Buell. So we'll be with you virtually as well on Facebook. So stick with us there too. Well, we hope you enjoyed uh, exploring the moon with us today. Um, the only thing better, I think, is getting outside and, and seeing the real thing. So we hope you have clear skies soon and get out there, see some of the, the features that we, we pointed out, the geologic wonder of the moon, and uh, keep looking up. Thank you, Carissa and, and Kayla and Julie. Awesome work. Uh, it was fun talking about the moon with you tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Thank you.